a new series I'll be doing of reading streams. Um, the first book we'll be reading is Emile Turan's A History of Decay. A short history of decay, excuse me. I, I really think this is an extraordinary book for a couple of reasons, which I will probably talk about later. Today I'd mostly like to get into reading it. All I will say is I think it's a really nice, a really nice contrast to the sort of sentimentality, the religion of sentimentality, the philosophy of sentimentality that has infected, not infected, that implies, it's negative, um, that just kind of is what millennials and Gen Z are kind of buying into right now, this sort of self-love, self-care, all about goodness and all about like pumping yourself up and all about like you can do it you know it's kind of the prevailing pop culture philosophy right now um what i like about this is that it kind of embraces negative emotions as a way to explore reality um, and that fits really well with my personal philosophy um, so without any further ado i'm gonna launch right in We actually are going to read the foreword by Eugene Thacker. Um, I think it's a really good introduction to this text. There are writers that one seeks out, and there are writers that one stumbles upon. Emile Turan is arguably of the latter kind. Such was my own introduction to his work as a student meandering one rainy afternoon in a used bookstore in Seattle. In the philosophy section, probably squeezed between Cicero and Confucius, was a book that jumped out simply by its title, A Short History of Decay. Spine creased and slightly dog-eared, it was by an author I knew nothing about. But the title was evocative. Decay, decline, decadence. These are never popular topics, especially in an era such as ours, Equally enamored with the explanatory power of science as we are with an almost religious preoccupation with self-help. But how can one write a short history of decay? And is there not something contradictory in assembling a history of decay? Even the original French title, Précis de Decomposition, is curious. In French, one often gives the title Précis to textbook summaries. For example, a précis de littérature française, ou a précis de mathématiques. But a précis of decay, it seemed absurd to write such a book. And so I bought it. That used bookstore no longer exists, though I still have my copy of Chiron's book. Originally published in 1949, A Short History of Decay was the first book Chiron wrote in French. Born in a small Romanian village of Rossinari in 1911, Chiron attended university in Bucharest, where he discovered the works of Pascal and Nietzsche. While there, he befriended Mircea Eliade and Eugene Ionesco. And while still in his twenties, he published several books in Romanian of impassioned and lyrical prose. He also became enthralled by the turbulent politics of the time, an enthusiasm that eventually gave way to disillusionment and bitterness. In the late 1930s, with the support of the French Institute in Bucharest, Chiron was in Paris, ostensibly to write his philosophy thesis. Instead, he spent many of his days bicycling around France. For Turan, it was a time of intense poverty. Not only was it difficult to make ends meet, but he experienced both a cultural and linguistic self-exile. Writing in a language not his own, in a style composed entirely of fragments, during the long nights of insomnia that he would struggle with his entire life. In the 1940s, against the backdrop of World War, Turan began a project originally entitled Negative Exercises, then Secondhand Thinker, before finally becoming a short history of decay in the present translation. The project opened a floodgate in his thinking, resulting in some 800 manuscript pages and four different manuscript versions of the book. When A Short History of Decay was published, it tended to polarize readers. Many dismissed it as an overly morose and pessimistic, completely out of tune with the obligatory optimism of post-war European culture. Others praised it for precisely these reasons. 
In his review of the book, Maurice Nadeau proclaimed Charon the one whose arrival has been prepared by all the philosophers of the void and of the absurd, harbinger of bad news par excellence. The original impact of Charon's book can still be felt in reading A Short History of Decay today. Like Nietzsche, Charon is intent on exposing the hypocrisies of the human condition. But unlike Nietzsche, Charon never once offers a way out, a new horizon, or even words of inspiration. And yet, there is an enthusiasm in Charon's prose that comes through. In spite of his predilection towards pessimism and despair, it is because it rests on nothing, because it lacks even the shadow of, of an argument that we preserve, that we persevere, excuse me, in life. How invent a remedy for existence? How conclude this endless cure? And how recover from your own birth? Those were all quotes. There is a kind of ecstasy. There's a kind of ecstasy of the worst in Charan's writing that manifests itself in his many voices, sometimes philosophical, sometimes poetic, sometimes political, always polemical. A Short History of Decay is at once a work of philosophy and yet a sort of song, a conflicted and agonistic testament of the magnificent utility that is humanity. And the ambivalence this book expresses is arguably more and more relevant today in our own era of climate change, peak oil, and disasters both natural and artificial. Though his books are well regarded today, and though he received many literary prizes for them, nearly all of which he refused. Choron always held the worlds of literature and philosophy at arm's length. His willful experiment with style has largely prevented his work from being easily recognized. Neither philosophy nor poetry, neither essay nor novel, neither manifesto nor confession. Perhaps he preferred it this way. Of course, in our digital age, it's quite easy to find Charan's books. The real question is why one would read them. In this sense, perhaps the only way to encounter Charan is to stumble across him, as if by accident or by fate. That concludes the foreword, and we're going to get it now into the text. We'll probably read anywhere from six to ten pages. We'll see. We'll see how long it takes us. So here we are in the first section of the book, entitled "Directions for Decomposition." Although I think that might be backwards for you. Um, or no, it's not. <laughs> I can't really tell. Directions for Decomposition, Part 1. This section is entitled, Genealogy of Fanaticism. And it is a humdinger. In itself, every idea is neutral, or should be. But man animates ideas, projects his flames and flaws into them. Impure, transformed into beliefs, ideas take their place in time, take shape as events. The trajectory is complete, from logic to epilepsy, whence the birth of ideologies, doctrines, deadly games. Idolaters by instinct, we convert the objects of our dreams and our interests into the unconditional. History is nothing but a procession of false absolutes, a series of temples raised to pretexts, a degradation of the mind before the improbable. Even when he turns from religion, man remains subject to it. Depleting himself to create fake gods, he then feverishly adopts them. His need for fiction, for mythology, triumphs over evidence and absurdity alike. His power to adore is responsible for all his crimes. A man who loves a god unduly forces other men to love his god, eager to exterminate them if they refuse. 
There is no form of intolerance, of proselytism or ideological intransigence, which fails to reveal the bestial substratum of enthusiasm. Once man loses his faculty of indifference, he becomes a potential murderer. Once he transforms his idea into a god, the consequences are incalculable. We kill only in the name of a god or of his counterfeits. The excesses provoked by the goddess reason, by the concept of nation, class, or race, are akin to those of the Inquisition or of the Reformation. The ages of fervor abound in bloody exploits. A Saint Teresa could only be the contemporary of the auto de fe. A Luther of the repression of the peasants' revolt. In every mystic outburst, the moans of victims parallel the moans of ecstasy. Scaffolds, dungeons, jails flourish only in the shadow of a faith, of that need to believe which has infested the mind forever. The devil pales beside the man who owns a truth, his truth. We are unfair to a Nero, a Tiberius. It was not they who invented the concept heretic. They were only degenerate dreamers who happened to be entertained by massacres. The real criminals are men who establish an orthodoxy on the religious or political level, men who distinguish between the faithful and the schismatic. When we refuse to admit the interchangeable character of ideas, blood flows. Firm resolves draw the dagger, fiery eyes presage slaughter. Presage? Presage? I don't know. No wavering mind, infected with Hamletism, was ever pernicious. The principle of evil lies in the will's tension, in the incapacity for quietism, in the Promethean megalomania of a race that bursts with ideals, that explodes with its convictions, and that, in return, for having forsaken doubt and sloth, vices nobler than all its virtues, has taken the path to perdition, into history, that indecent alloy of banality and apocalypse. Here, certitudes abound. Suppress them. Best of all, suppress their consequences, and you recover paradise. What is the fall but the pursuit of a truth and the assurance you have found it? The passion for a dogma, domicile within a dogma. The result is fanaticism, fundamental defect which gives man the craving for effectiveness, for prophecy, for terror. A lyrical leprosy by which he contaminates souls, subdues them, crushes, or exalts them. Only the skeptics, or idlers, escape. Because they propose nothing. Because they, humanity's true benefactors, undermine fanaticism's purposes, analyze its frenzy. I feel safer with a Pyrrho than with a St. Paul. For a jesting wisdom is gentler than an unbridled sanctity. In the fervent mind, you always find the camouflaged beast of prey. No protection is adequate against the claws of a prophet. Once he raises his voice, whether in the name of heaven, of the city, or some other excuse, away with you. Satyr of your solitude, he will not forgive your living on the wrong side of his truths and his transports. He wants you to share his hysteria, his fullness. He wants to impose it on you and thereby to disfigure you. A human being possessed by a belief and not eager to pass it on to others is a phenomenon alien to the earth where our mania for salvation makes life unbreathable. Look around you, everywhere, specters preaching. Each institution translates a mission. City halls have their absolute even as the temples, officialdom with its rules, a metaphysics designed for monkeys. Everyone trying to remedy everyone's life. 
Even beggars, even the incurable aspire to it. The sidewalks and hospitals of the world overflow with reformers. The longing to become a source of events affects each man like a mental disorder or a desired malediction. Society, an inferno of saviors. What Diogenes was looking for with his lantern was an indifferent man. It is enough for me to hear someone talk sincerely about ideals, about the future, about philosophy, to hear him say, we, with a certain inflection of assurance, to hear him invoke others and regard himself as their interpreter, for me to consider him my enemy. I see in him a tyrant monk, monke, an approximate, execu an approximate executioner, quite as detestable as the first-rate tyrants, the first-rate executioners. Every faith practices some form of terror, all the more dreadful when the pure are its agents. We mistrust the swindler, the trickster, the con man, yet to them we can impute none of history's great convulsions. Believing in nothing, it is not they who rummage in your hearts or your, or, or your ulterior motives. They leave you to your apathy, to your despair, or to your uselessness. To them, humanity owes the few moments of prosperity it has known. It is they who save the peoples whom, fa whom fan... It is they who save the peoples whom fanatics torture and idealists destroy. Doctrineless, they have only whims and interests, accommodating vices a thousand times more endurable than the ravages provoked by principled despotism. For all of life's evils come from a conception of life. An accomplished politician should search out the ancient sophists and take lessons in oratory and in corruption. Whereas the fanatic is incorruptible. If he kills for an idea, he can just as well get himself killed for one. In either case, tyrant or martyr, he is a monster. No human beings more dangerous than those who have suffered for a belief. The great persecutors are recruited among the martyrs not quite beheaded. Far from diminishing the appetite for power, suffering exasperates it. Hence the mind feels more comfortable in the society of a braggart than in that of a martyr. And nothing is more repugnant to it than the spectacle of dying for an idea. Revolted by the sublime and by carnage, the mind dreams of a provincial ennui on the scale of the universe, of a history whose stagnation would be so great that doubt would take on the lineaments of an event and hope a calamity. And that's all for today. See you next time.